Welcome to Founder Brunch, the third in the series. Um, I'm recognising a few faces in the room. Um, so some of you have been here before and some of you are newbies. Who's been here before? Okay, who's new today? Okay, so everybody who's been here before, have a look at those people and go, hi, people. <laughs> and be super nice to those people after we, uh, after we finish this Q&A. So, um, like I say, third in the series, we're really lucky to have Patrick with us today. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Samantha Deakin, I'm one of the um, mentors here at University of Sheffield Enterprise, specialising in tech startups. Even though um, Patrick is himself from a tech startup, we're making this as relevant to any industry as possible today, so don't worry if you're not interested in tech, this is not going to be a talk about tech. So um, that's the first thing to get out of the way. Um, I'm part of a team of three um, mentors who work from this space, Darren Chowings, who um, deals with social enterprise, and um, Janet Grant at the back there, who is our specialist in business growth. So welcome, thanks for joining us, I hope you've all got a coffee and you've had plenty of coffee and time to chat. There'll be more time to chat afterwards as well. So. Hi Patrick. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Just to um, introduce Patrick Speedy. Um, so Patrick is the founder of um, Sheffield tech company InPart, um, which is a platform that interfaces between academic institutions and industry um, and allows them to um, collaborate on creating and commercialising intellectual property, which is a lot of big words, um, yeah. which we're not going to get into. Um, it's difficult to explain in, in simple terms to even to friends and family and they try and explain what it is and they switch off after like the first three weeks. <laughs> we find that with a lot of our um, tech companies I think. Um, so but the last few years has been really interesting for Patrick and I think um, some of the process that he's been through and some of the challenges that he's had um, should be easy, easier to explain and, and get across to you guys and really relevant to um, I know some of the situations that, that you're in right now. Um, so just a quick timeline then. Quite early on, raised initial angel investment. Mm -hmm. um, you signed up basically all of the Russell Group universities in the country nearly, um, up to the platform. Grew the team to um, eight people, then raised further VC investment. Is now scaling to the US, and today he is moving offices to across the road. This morning. So, which is one of the key indicators of growth, right, when you outgrow the space that you're working in. So that's just a little summary. Um, I'm only gonna, gonna ask a few questions and then I'm gonna open it up to you guys to um, ask more questions. So jumping straight in, um, out of everything that I just described then, um, what stands out to you as being the most challenging part of your journey so far? Yeah, it's a tough one. There's a lot, if everyone here is founders, there's a lot of different challenges that people face. I think the first big one was the sort of, the leap into thinking, have we, do we have something here that we can actually employ ourselves doing, you know, pay ourselves? Have we got a concept that's viable? Who can we speak to? And then, and then you get to a point where, okay, so we got our angel investment and you know, that was you know, a small SEIS investment and we both decided, my co-founder and I both decided to quit our jobs at that point. So you're going to pay yourself a salary, so you're going to start chewing through money quite quickly about to build a website and that, the moment of thinking, okay, right, my colleague handed his, my co-founder handed his notes in. I quit my my job and was like, "This is what we're doing now." You know, before then you sort of like I don't want to say you're playing at it, but you're still sort of you know, you, you've got your idea of a business that you want to build, and you're still you know reassuring yourself that the concept is is good. Um, you know, looking at the competitive landscape and validating the ideas that you've had, and then you take that leap of faith, and all of a sudden you're sort of we were on opposite sides of the country, so you know, it's not like you know the social network where they just you know, swilling beers and jumping in pools. We were like, you know, sat in a room on our own for the first six months, um, speaking to each other by phone and, and trying to do meetings and all that sort of stuff. So the biggest challenge is sort of, you know, you back yourself to to leave your job and to, to go at it full time. Um, and you've obviously got a window of opportunity where we had a certain amount of money where we could pay ourselves and build a website and we needed to, to sell our subscriptions that we, that we put together. So that was, that was definitely the first big heart in the mouth Losing lots of sleep, sort of, uh, sort of hurdle that we took, and then, um, yeah, the second. How did you make that decision? How did you? Was there ever a, a part of you that thought this might fail? Oh, massively, yeah. You know, on a number of occasions. 
you know, there's not been one moment where I've thought this might fail, and then the rest has been like we're golden by any stretch. You know, no, probably. So we launched, so we we got our it, it, um, angel investment September 2013, and we we aimed to launch in a month. It took us three months to get the system built. So we actually launched in January. And obviously, you can't really sell anything until you've got your system online. And we sell annual subscriptions to to universities. So. Um, we didn't really want to shout about what we're doing before we had the system in place to actually show people. So we had a sort of lag time to that and then we offered kind of two month trial periods to university. So luckily we got the, we had five or six that piloted with us that paid up front. Um, that wasn't much revenue but it was a bit. And then we had to kind of, we went out and at that point we were sort of trying to get meetings with different universities, offering them two month trial periods. So they'd take a while to submit their technologies, get approval of their profiles to go on our system. So it's always taken longer than two months, and then after they finish, they sort of we generate we, we generate these kind of analytics reports and feed feed it back to them. So we feed that back, try and set up a conference call, and that would take you know two weeks to get everyone on the call. Then they'd say, okay, this sounds great. We've got to go and speak internally to people. So the, the decision making process, and even after they say yes, it's like okay, we've got to generate a purchase order, um, send us your invoice. You know, we didn't even have terms and conditions written up at that point. You know, we hadn't really thought about it until they said, you know, send us your terms and conditions. We were like, cock. <laughs> you better, better write some terms and conditions. Um, how, done how, that? Do, how do we invoice them? You know? And yeah, so we, we, luckily one of the guys at King's College London says, look, here's an example of the terms and conditions that someone else has sent to us. It was That's completely nice. irrelevant, but we saw the format of what they put in there. We looked on, like, this is probably off the record, but we looked on Nature's terms and conditions to kind of see what they've got and sort of drafted Copy it from and there. Improve. Yeah, so there's that, and then, yeah, so we had the lag time between getting our first new sales in from launch was. You know, we got down to a point where, you know, we're in a month and we can't pay ourselves at the end of this month unless we get an invoice paid. And that probably happened twice in the first year. That Luckily, we didn't have to do that. We did get an invoice paid and pay ourselves. But it was, you know, within a week, you know, and we have to, we would have gone and paid for a month. You know, we had good, we felt that it was going well, but still at that point, you sort of a nervy moment when you've got rent to pay. And, you know, me and my co-founder, you know, we've not. We didn't have money or anything, you know, we're not wealthy people when we started business or anything. Still not now, but, you know, that was a hard math moment as well. Just a show of hands quickly, who's at the point where um, they're sort of pre-making that full-time jump into their, into their start-up? And who has actually made that leap? Okay. All right. Cool. Interesting. And, um... You touched on a little bit there about some of the, the time issues, right, of, you know, you thought it would take this long, but it actually took three times as long. Um, you went straight for customers in, um, in, as universities, mm -hmm. large organisations, um, public organisations. Um, how, how did you break into universities and um, what other challenges were there apart from time and bureaucracy? Mm. Which are two really big ones. <laughs> you work in the university, you know. You tell me. Um, <laughs> they're a pain in the ass. But That's um, off the <laughs> I mean, they're, they're they're good payers. So you know, if they say they're going to do something, they will definitely pay eventually. So if anyone else is dealing with the public, trying to get payments from them, I think is probably at least as difficult, if not more difficult, because people, you know, just sat on invoices. They don't they don't pay them. You're not going to really take them to court unless it's a big invoice. So universities, once they say yes, they do pay. There's just a kind of lag time to them to them doing it. Yeah, and it was difficult. So we, our system didn't exist. You know, people said to us that, that well, was, people tried to do it before, and we looked at what happened before, and we were like, well, that's rubbish. You know, ours is better than that, and for these reasons. Um, so, and also, generally, the people we're dealing with work in the sort of tech transfer office, the commercialization office, and there's kind of mid, middle-aged people, I guess. I'd say so. I'd say they're pretty adverse to change. You know, so trying to convince them that we had a system that would help their day-to-day -day processes, you know, by you know introducing them to new companies. You know, there's there's a lot of reticence about how that would work. Who were we? What was our background? Who are we to come up with this idea and and all that sort of stuff? Not probably said in so many words to our faces, but there's definitely a, a lot of reticence about you know who you're working with now. And then once we've now we've got a client base which includes you know yeah 12, 13 of the Russell Group. Um, MIT, Princeton, we've got on our system now. So when we do our demos now, everyone's like, well, either all these people are wrong and I'm right, or more likely all these people are right and I'm wrong. So, but we didn't have that at the start. You know, we had a handful. So trying to convince, it was convincing people more about the, the value proposition and what it could do than what it had done. You know, we didn't have case studies, for example, or many case studies. Um, so that was definitely, it's definitely a challenge. I think it's, it's a sector that's, um, 
and again, you'll know you probably won't want to say too much about it, but you know, is the, the bureaucracy it, the bureaucracy is very difficult you know with, with universities you know the decision making process so we made some mistakes at the start by speaking to people that weren't the decision makers and wasted a lot of time that way like upwards of a year some some universities um, that we introduced them to we trialed our system and then it went really well but getting the decision from the right person you know they obviously weren't pitching it internally as we would pitch it to their superiors you know they're sort of one guy said to me yeah I sort of mentioned it in the corridor yeah, to my boss, and he sort of, yeah, it wasn't really that bothered. And I was like, we spent two months, you know, promoting, matchmaking your technologies with companies. We introduced them to very senior people in R&D. One of them turned out to a really cool collaboration. We generated a detailed analytics report, and he just mentioned it in the corridor. You know, it was, that is really frustrating. Um, but you can't do anything, you know, you've still got to be nice to, to people. Same as if you work in a restaurant, you've got to be nice to your customers, you know. Um, so you get to the decision makers, sort of? So now, I guess we, we know very, we're, we're very well attuned with who the person is, the role they play. So, head of commercialization, um, director of the Knowledge Transfer Institute. Universities for Tech Transfer are structured in slightly different ways, um, but we're pretty well attuned to who will be the person that can decide. Um, and we now ask, so if we meet someone who's a technology transfer manager, for example, some of them have pitched it internally and bought a subscription, but we'll ask them. We're going to come and do a meeting, but can we have the decision makers in the room? So we're quite forthright about saying um, we want you know the person who's going to sign off on the subscription to be there, if at all possible. Yeah. Um, and most of the time that works pretty well. At the start, we wouldn't dare do that. Yeah, I was wondering about that and um, thinking back to some of my experience when I was running my company as well, and how what was the what was the tipping point for you where you're like, no, we have something here actually, we are right. You know, and how? At what point did you know that you had to change your tack, mm. and you could, and still be taken seriously? It took a while. Um, even though I think we knew we knew we were right throughout the first year, um, you know, just having a sort of we're right, no, we're right, no, we're right. That conversation when you're trying to, you know, get clients doesn't doesn't really work. So you sort of have to play a little bit of lip service to people. But yeah, after the first year, and um, we got people like we managed to get Cambridge signed up, um, and and I think. So, so probably the middle of last year, our, our pitch was was really, really strong. So we were going to do demos and showing them the universities we were working with. And um, we had lots of different real world examples to attest to of successes from our system. We had a really good metrics that we can point to of, of our matchmaking success rate, um, which had gone up throughout throughout that year. Um, so I think as we just, we just build you know, more I think our system just became more robust by the more information we had in it, the more knowledge we had about what had happened, the clients that we had. We were signing up more and more companies all, all the time. Um, so, yeah, the more, once we had the top ten pharma companies, for example, being able to say that in, in a demo to the you know the person who's managing the medical technologies at a particular institute, you know, they'll work with some of those companies, but they won't work with all of them. They might know someone in those companies, but they might not know the right person either. So, yeah, that was it. Just became. Yeah, stronger and stronger, but probably yeah, probably took a year, 18 months before it's kind of unequivocal that they were kind of saying, okay, well, you guys have really done something here. And so you you touched on this a little bit earlier um, that you know your your co-founder is based in in London. Mm. Um, first of all, how do you know each other? Um, but then secondly, how does that work? Your team being split between two cities, and what are the challenges there? Yeah, interesting. It was a point in our board meeting um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know Rob from school. So we went to school together, I've known him since we were 15. Um, he's an ex-academic, um, so he's an immunologist, was working on type 1 diabetes research. Um, and I was working in London for a publishing company, so um, legal publishing. So I always say publishing, people think, oh great, it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's actually like intellectual property books and uh, life sciences and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and we, we both worked at London Bridge, so I knew him from school anyway. We've been, you know, he's the best man at my wedding. Um, and would have been anyway, but yeah, so I've known it for a, for a while and we were just, we got to chat about it. I've been at an event um, in Chicago with my, my old work and sort of met these two academics, met these two people in a company and they were like, the guy in the company says, I've been looking for this antibody for the last three years, I just can't find it. And then the academic says, that's my last four years worth of work. But there's 30,000 people at this event and you know, serendipity can't be the way to you know, give the amount of money that's spent on research. So that sort of sowed the seed in my mind. I went and chatted with Rob and he was um, yeah, setting up a platform for immunology students to share mistakes they were making in the lab, mm -hmm. um, which got a little bit of traction, but I don't, it, won, it wasn't going to 
fully launch, I don't think. And we got to chat about it in the pub, basically. Yeah, we wrote the mission statement on the way home on the bus in London. Um, and then, yeah, I came to do a master's at the University of Sheffield. And one of the one of that one of the reasons was to try and explore my business idea without sort of taking a, a you know sort of gap in my CV, so to speak. I wanted to do a master's anyway, um, and I was I was sick of my old job really. So yeah, I came here and knocked on the enterprise centre's door. I remember a good while ago, lately, Janet and. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you could pitch for like uh, the small amount of funding that we got, um, and that really helped us go to the Venture Fest event and buy a conference ticket for something else. But yeah, the, since the very start, so I've been sat in an office on my own up here. Rob's been on his own down there. So it is, it is difficult. Um, it's in many ways we've had a sort of a benefit of having an office in London to do meetings with a lot of big companies because um, Samsung, for example, the head of Open Innovation, flew over to London. They contacted us. Would really like to meet you guys. So having an office in London to host people is useful but it's overtly expensive compared to, to Sheffield you know we're only ever gonna I think I've, we're, I've bought a meeting recently saying we're gonna have a small team down there and then we'll, we'll build a sort of HQ office up here where it's um, cost-effective talent pool still still very good um, but we use I mean everyone probably sort of slack you know we use slack and um, we so many I have to turn the notifications off because our team now is we're, we're now up to sort of 11 seem to be 12 and there's just so many things fine for it. It's useful for the team to put everything in one place. Um, Are there any other tools you use? So Slack, for those of you who don't know what Slack is, it's, it's sort of um, a communication platform for for teams really. Um, it's kind of an instant messaging and also... It's like a posh MSN messenger. If it is like a posh MSN messenger. messenger, that is a much better way to put yeah. that. Um, but are there any other tools that you use? We use, um, so we, we have Google Apps accounts for our emails, so we use Google Docs to sort of, some of our um, sort of database slash spreadsheets are, uh, are in Google Docs, so you can people can edit them live and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so if we're making sort of like our IT, for example, roadmap and stuff like that, it's in Google Docs, so everyone can see it and our developer can add to it and we can put comments on and it goes in real time. Um, we use. Um, we ditched Dropbox because Box is slightly cheaper, so we use, so have all the files update in real time, so you can sort of. That's quite useful, and we do, you know, video video calls. Mm -hmm. um, so we use Google Handout, Hangouts, and, and that sort of stuff. So the comms team, some are up here, some are down there. Um, they'll have, you know, weekly, bi-weekly meetings, and but they'll do a video link. We've actually got a girl who was in London, she's now in Canada, so she'll video link in from Canada wow, so, so you've got people all over yeah, the place now that's just her yeah she's really good she's moved back to Canada but um, that was her personal circumstances rather than a strategic play from her, okay. from us so we just kept her on to help us out for a bit um, but yeah it, it's it's a pain I wouldn't recommend it you know if you can get away with not having two officers like I mean part of it is Rob lives in London and his girlfriend's in London mm -hmm. like, I don't think she really wants to move so you know there's a there's a personal circumstance to, to both and I guess I like Sheffield so you know I don't really want to move to London um, so part of it's personal circumstance and then there are some business benefits but even sort of creative digital agencies that sell a lot to London companies if they've got offices in the north they'll just have a like a post box office in London they don't mm -hmm. you know, it's not that far on the train to get there. And so this person who's now in um, in Canada is is she helping with your sort of scale to the US or is that completely separate? Can you tell us about um, why you decided to scale to the US and what the challenges have been doing that from the UK? Yeah, so um, the UK has about, I don't know, 100 universities or so, and they're the people who pay our subscription fees. So it's quite a, you know, if you thought about it from an investment perspective, that being our only market, at, you know, an average subscription rate of sort of, you know, eight and a half, nine thousand pounds isn't a, a hugely scalable market. So the US has like two and a half thousand universities. Um, so EU has, I don't know, 600 or something, you know. So the, the, there's, a, there's a limitation to the market in the UK that meant we had to, once we got a, you know, a, a good sort of beachhead in the market that we <coughs> had to look internationally really. So we, um, um, we, are we familiar with the UKTI, UK Trade Investment? Yeah. So they, they're like a government organisation that help growth businesses expand internationally and they have various different calls you can apply to. So we applied to this competitive tender. So we met some of them and they said, you know, you'd be ideal for this particular tender. And it was to go to a life sciences event in Philadelphia, so you had to write an application form. I think we had to do a meeting, um, but they paid. They didn't. They didn't pay the flight, but they paid uh, the conference ticket, which was two and a half thousand pounds, 
and they paid five nights of accommodation and your food and everything else while you were there. So, and we were able to go to this big life science event and um, yeah, do partner meetings with a load of big biotech companies and stuff. So we used that as an excuse to do some preliminary meetings with US universities. So Rob went to the UKTI um, event and then I flew out and we did meetings on the East Coast. Um, so we just basically just got a list of you know the top universities on the East Coast, sent them all an email, called them all up, we're a UK startup, this is what we do, we'd like to come and meet you, we're going to be over in this sort of time window, um, could you spare some time for us basically? And most, probably 70% kind of said, yeah, you know, come down, we'll have a chat. Um, and so yeah, we just, yeah, so Rob came to New York, we met in New York and then did some meetings with NYU and City University New York, we went down to, to Princeton, um, we went up to MIT, we met with Boston University, we went with Northeastern University, a couple of others. Um, and that went really well, and the, the idea was to sort of set up a, similarly did in the UK, set up a pilot with US universities, knowing that our system, we didn't have to change anything in our system really, but that we wanted to be able to sort of, they weren't just going to buy in straight away basically, so we wanted to be able to prove that. So we did a, a three month pilot which ran from October last year until um, October, November till end of February. Um, and then there was a big tech transfer event in San Diego that we were sort of timing the end of it for, so we could then go and sort of shout about what we were doing. So they were quite open, you know, much more open than the UK universities have been to, to speaking to us in the initial sense, because I think they like entrepreneurship, you know, they're sort of, we're a startup and we've got this idea, it's in your space, and all this sort of rubbish. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, they were, the doors were all opened, you know, and they were, they were like, you know, well done guys. You know, that, they were kind of like almost like, Mothering us to a certain extent, I guess, but um, but yeah, they were really really open to it, and that was that was so we got them. But they didn't pay any money that we gave them for free for, for that period of time, and then our first um, two or three signed up, you know, three weeks ago, um, three four weeks ago. So that's really interesting. That was the process there. So we basically want to be able to get some key names. So then, so for the people that were following up from, from the the event in San Diego. So that was that event we did pay for. We bought a conference stand, and all the U.S. tech transfer offers are at this event. It's the event, so we were like, we've got to speculate to accumulate, sort of thing. Um, so we went to that, but we wanted to have some names that we'd already sort of had contacts with before we went there, um, and that I think worked really well. Mm. And yeah, that, that's really interesting. The the difference in terms of how receptive they were to, um, I guess, to helping you and, and supporting you because you were a startup. Now that they've become customers, what what are the differences between UK and US? Mm. I guess universities as customers. Yeah, it, it's different, and I guess part of the I don't know if it's it's fifty percent benefit, fifty percent problem is that all the technology transfer officers know each other. So if we say, "Oh, we've been piloting with Princeton," all the people would say, "Oh, it's John at Princeton," and we're mm. like, "Yeah, it's John," um, or like it's Lita Nielsen at MIT. We're like, yeah, yeah, Lita, but they're not. You know, well, they're piloting with us, so we don't want to. You can't say too much about people who aren't fully fledged, you know, registered, you know, subscribers or whatever. And even when they do, so the first few have subscribed. A lot of the U.S. universities are saying to us, "Can we speak to someone you're already working with in the U.S.?" So we'd say, "Well, yeah," but they're not going to say that much about us. You know, they've only just we've convinced them to sign up for the subscription, but proofs in the first year of using our, our system. So it's it's been kind of. It's been a difficult, a lot of people have asked for references from us. You know, I had an email today from Leicester's and the University of Utah had a conference call with the day before. I've just obviously looked at who were in our system and started emailing, mm. you know, clients of ours to get information about how our system works. And Leicester only signed up last month, so they'll say they've bought our subscription, but they're not going to say, these guys are amazing, you know. I don't know. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a weird sort of market where everybody knows each other. So we have to be very careful that if we get some negativity, from someone who's very well placed, yeah. that could really hurt us in, in the US market. And we, that is still a problem. That is a genuine problem now that if someone has a, you know, hopefully they won't have a bad experience with, it, with our system, but if they did, I think it would. There's a chance it could spread like spread like wildfire. Mm. And so what, what are you doing um, right now to sort of, what are the things that you put in place to minimize that risk? We've got we've we've got very well thought out and well trodden processes that we use from start to finish. You know, logistical stuff, how they submit their technologies, when it, how many days before we get it online. Um, so we, I guess, managing their expectations as to what they should get. Um, we give them our overall annual sort of you know success metric, which is kind of seventy five percent match rate from submitting technologies to getting introductions to companies. Um, that's an average, and that's how we benchmark ourselves. So over the year. 
that is our goal to get at least 75% hit rate. So for every 10 technologies they submit to get seven introductions basically. Um, and so far we've been managing to, to hit that. It's an average, so few have come below that. Um, that's sort of, yeah, I guess, yeah, but it, it, it's an ongoing problem. You know, we, we, we have a, a few of our processes we, we're just about to streamline much more than they are at the moment. So there's a lot of admin in the background that goes between storing people's details in a separate database, storing it in our actual web database, our user interface. Um, and we're actually going to be rolling that together, creating a task manager so people can manage, for example, company signups as they come in, make sure they're alerted to the most appropriate technologies. Um, and then from a university perspective, make sure that they're the stats are generated at the right time, they're followed up with, we speak to them you know, once every other month to find out what else they've got coming up. And so it's just about, we're very well tuned to how, what success looks like in the UK, we have a 100% renewal rate so far. So keep, keeping that going is, you know, what we've done so far must be worth renewing. So we're just trying to keep what we did, focused on sort of customer retention, I guess. So we're at the moment. 100% retention rate. Yeah. That's uh, it's not a bad metric. <laughs> it wasn't easy, yeah. No, I'm sure it wasn't. Yeah. And I guess that's um, <coughs> that must be one of the things that you were presenting as well as, you know, um, you, you touched on it earlier about um, two investors just focusing in the UK wasn't mm. that attractive because the market size is, is not sort of large enough and that's why you went to the US. Um, but that metric must have been quite important as well. Um, was it the UK metric? The the hundred percent retention. Oh yeah, massively. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. You know, people, especially when you present something to them, there you throw a lot of information at them, and, and certain things stick. You know, and that was one that we in our in our pitch deck that I must have said. I mean, they were laughing by the end how many times I'd said it, like genuinely laughing at how many times we said it. But you know, we're really proud of this success rate. It was hundred percent renewal rate, and and we got hundred percent conversion rate from our trial. So the word hundred percent was just you know ingrained in, in what, this, what they said. They didn't look annoyed, but I think any more and it probably would have pushed it too far. But yeah, no, it, it definitely was, you know, it's proof of principle. So, and but, you know, a lot of, so we've got other products that we, we want to, to roll out as well. And that was part of the sort of the pitch and the scalability of our business. But, you know, a big part of that is we've expanded to the US, Asia, Australia, EU. We've never done this before. You know, they, they've got to, you know, I think, other people who start businesses who've maybe done that before give that pitch and it's just easy. I've done it before, you know, I grew a business from, I don't know, half a million to 10 million in two years and, and they just nod and say, fantastic, you know, go and do it again. Um, so they do have, you have to sort of, I guess you, it's sort of like a kind of interview process where you say, you know, we can do this, believe in us, sort of thing. But at the end of the day, they have to, you know, it's a leap of faith to a certain extent. But yeah, it was important, yeah, thinking about the things that, you know, obviously the people that we're already working with, um, you know, university clients, the companies we've got signed up, all those things are, when you give a pitch, the things that stick with people. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd advise anyone from a sales process, anyone you can, that people are familiar with that you can mention, it just sticks with people. You know, it's a reassurance to know that if someone that they know is doing something that you're talking to them about, you know, that's how we get in a lot of, of doors. And that's how we got introduced to our, our, our VC investors, was from one of our universities. Who we're already working with. Okay. Because I think I'm right in thinking that almost, well, 99% of people in the room, if not 100% of people in the room, are in are going to be at best in the situation that you were in where they've not done this before. Um, so I don't think there's anyone here who's grown a billion dollar company yet. No? <laughs> yeah. So we're all coming from the same sort of position. This is the first time that we're doing this. Um, and so hearing from people who have just managed to go through that process is obviously you know, really valuable. Um, but while we're on VCs, is it the holy grail? No, I mean, we didn't, we didn't, if we'd have found other investors that would have put the same amount of money in for the same valuation, we'd have, we'd have gone with them. It wasn't, we didn't necessarily need or want a, a VC. It, it does have some appeal for certain VCs. So for example, the ones that we've VC is now. venture capitalist, by the way, for anybody who's unsure. Um, it's usually a firm that um, invests in you know, several companies across a portfolio, as opposed to an angel investor who is usually just 
someone with a lot of money, an individual with a lot of money who will invest in the companies that they want to. Um, and generally VCs aren't investing their own money, so they, they manage a, you know, a fund of mm -hmm. other people's money, be it pension fund or you know, high net worth individuals have put money into their fund to get tax breaks and stuff. So mm -hmm. generally they put you know, experts in various different fields and then they'll invest in the fields that they know about for their fund, whereas business angels invest in their, generally invest in their own money. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the benefits you do have is that they, you know, they they do bring a lot of contacts with them. So we've been introduced to, to quite a few people since we've had our um, investors on board, and they also have the potential to follow on. Our, our, you know, if, if we do want to raise any more money in the future, um, you know, if we go back to them and say we've run out of money, we want more money, that's going to be the worst case scenario. They're going to really hold us to the wall, as you know, most venture capital would. But if we can show that we have a, you know, we're in a growth phase and we need additional investment, they are there to potentially give that as well. But it's definitely not the whole, whole grail. Um, I'd say probably, you know, because we've had a business angel investor from the start, um, and he's been great. You know, he's, you know, I heard, you know, people, hear some horror stories at the start where they want to be really involved and, you know, they're you know, nitpicking, they want to be in each week and, and all that sort of stuff. We met with him once a month throughout the first year. Um, we did management accounts monthly for him. Um, he just let us get on with it. I think we had to, if we were going to spend some over two thousand pounds on any one thing, um, we had to run it by him first. Um, I think through the first year, if we wanted to employ anyone, we had to run it by him first. But you know, that's what I would have wanted. Mm -hmm. If that was me doing it, you know, it's not unreasonable requests. I guess you have to be slightly pragmatic and say, he's still giving me a chunk of his chunk of his money. Mm -hmm. So that that worked really well, and I think we. You know, we didn't need investment. You know, we didn't need the money to carry on trading. You know, we were in a growth phase. We turned a small profit last year, but um, <laughs> a f yeah, a small, small profit. You have to cheer when you yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, it was, yeah, didn't feel that way somehow. You know, it wasn't, we weren't laughing all the way to the bank, but um, that's off my thought process. But Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he um, he's been good anyway. The, the Mr. Sager, yeah. It's, we, oh, that was it, yeah. So we weren't, we didn't need the investment, but we sort of, I don't know. Investors will talk to you about first mover advantage and, and all that sort of stuff, and we were very conscious that if someone came along in our sector with a big chunk of money um, and did exactly the same thing as what we were doing, you know, that you know our competitive advantage was the clients that would build up the unique aspects of our system. But once you disclose that to someone, and partly we're doing that to our clients, and you can't stop them speaking to people. Um, there was a danger, I think, that there could have been a space in the market for someone else to come in, mm -hmm. and we sort of we we built a sort of a growth phase and a lot of I don't, know, I don't like the word traction, but we got more clients anyway throughout that year, and we wanted to sort of to scale the business. We needed to put in additional infrastructure to manage, you know, partly the additional administration and partly putting in additional infrastructure in the in the web system um, to actually handle the additional traffic. So that's why we kind of started to look for more investment as part of a sort of slightly bolster our competitiveness, but also, yeah, bring in additional uh, infrastructure to the team. There are so many other things that I want to ask you, but I'm being really selfish um, <laughs> in not opening it up to everyone else. So I just want to um, ask you, um, no, in fact, I'm, I'll save that until the end. I want to open it up to um, everybody else in the room um, for questions. Yeah, Scott. Um, okay, so scaling the business. Hi. Sorry, just one second. Before you ask a question, if you could just introduce yourself and just say your name and what it is that you, either your company name or the project that you're working on. My name's Scott. Um, I run Tutora. I'm a co-founder of Tutora, an online marketplace that matches students and tutors. Um, but we're at kind of phase where we've got investment, so we're now looking to scale the business. Um, so I was wondering how you go about determining where you spend your money in terms of um, scaling the business and looking to gain more clients or adding additional features or building out the admin side of things. Mm. It's, 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 we're finding it quite hard to, to determine what to do between those three. Mm. It's a constant balancing act and how you can solve that problem. Yeah, it's a re really good question. And, um, there's definitely not one answer, yeah. I, I don't think. But So we, we've, we built our system and the, the user interface to our system literally hasn't changed since, since we launched it. Pretty much, we changed the landing page a little bit. So we put some additional information of why a company should sign up. We kept it really kind of stripped down at the start because we didn't really want everyone to know fully what we were doing, um, particularly for universities. But um, we kept it really stripped down. But the main interface has been pretty much exactly the same. Some of the background architecture has been updated and improved, but we've only had our developer full time since January. 
Um, so he's been part time. So we've only been able to get, and part of that was we didn't really want to spend much money on it because you know it's it, web costs money. You know, as soon as you employ someone, you know, you're talking about you know thirty plus thousand pounds a year to pay a developer. So that's basically just IT cost, um, which we've now done because we we need to kick on a little bit. But at the start, we kept it really stripped down, and I, I guess. So companies sign up to our system for free, so there's no revenue in that, but we have to think about how we market our system to companies because it's self-perpetuating. If companies sign up and are contacting our universities, the universities have a good time, they keep paying their subscription, we can get more universities to sign up, so we have to spend money on companies signing up, i.e. going to events, meeting them. We do some, um, we've started doing some LinkedIn advertising, we do rich content, so we do blogs, technology of the week, and, and we put that out through LinkedIn, and and stuff like that and we've started doing some sponsored posts but and trying to track how many sign-ups you get to what you spend is is really difficult there's a um, one that we won this tech north uh, northern stars thing one of the other companies is a music app and for every 5p they spend on youtube advertising they get a sign up so that is like you know if we could do that that you you know at the moment as it's like 10 15 quid uh, you know it's not we don't do we don't blast do it because it is too expensive at the moment so but they've, they've really, really worked it out. And then, yeah, the other side is people that we needed to get in because we were just spinning plates and we couldn't do everything. You know, so that, that was what we started to do at the, at the very beginning. So we went down the route when we were employing people who was getting interns in. So we'd do six week internships. Um, the science communications course here at Sheffield, um, the, what they learn in that year is basically ideal for someone to come and work in our team. So they learn. Um, they've all got a science or engineering background, so they want to, most of them have sort of had an interest in science but didn't want to work in a lab, so they like communicating about technology, and that's basically what our system does. So they're an ideal sort of skill set. So we got interns in because we just got to a point where, you know, however many hours you're working today, you know, some stuff has to fall off. Um, and that was starting to happen, and that's a sort of a nerve in time. And some of it's straightforward stuff you can give to some interns. So we had six week internships. Um, the first one we did, you know, was 50 50. One intern we got just totally bombed. Um, the other one is now our head of communications and has been with us for two years, so um, probably a bit less than two years, but yeah, best part of two years. Um, and then we've done that every other time since then, so we sort of, my biggest fear is employing people that then, you know, will tread water or, you know, not work hard enough and, and it's, in a small company it's so obvious, you know, if, if someone isn't doing what you're asking them to do, they're not, you know, I don't want people that just do what they're told as well. Um, you know, people sat in this room with people coming up with businesses and and ideas, you're, you're not doing you know, what you're told, you're coming up with it yourself and you're going out and doing it. So I want employees that will, to a certain extent, you have to give them some guidance, but you know, to a certain extent, do that. So um, I think I've talked around your question there quite a bit, but it, it's difficult. So the, I guess the, the, the first decision was, we've got too much stuff to do, we can't do it all ourselves, we need additional pairs of hands to take up some of this slack first and foremost. We kept our developer at arm's length as long as we could basically because we wanted to keep the cost of running the system as low as possible um, so we basically outsourced our IT to him he's he's working with us now and he, you know, he could have said no because he's had his own business at that, that point but um, yeah that's we tried to keep the IT costs absolute minimum I'd say I wouldn't I've spoken to a lot of other companies and they spend a lot of time on the user interface additional features and unless you can unless you can get a blanket response from a lot of people using your system that they need something specific, you know, I wouldn't change it. So we get people say, oh, it'd be really useful to be able to download a PDF. Um, we've had that a few times, but we don't want them downloading PDFs because then the data points go outside our system and we can't track the analytics. So we don't, they want that, but we don't really want to let them have it. Um, like, can our colleagues sign up? We're like, yeah, here's the link, come and sign up, but they're going to have to register punch their details in and then we'll know who they are and we'll know they're generating data points we can then use to feed back to a university. So but a few features asked for that we've not given people. And then some of them just sort of random things. We come up with ideas and we think, oh that's a really cool idea. Yeah, perhaps we should just you know we'll just do it. And then you realise it's sort of a month and a half's worth of development work. It's gonna cost you X amount of money. Um, are you gonna see the return or is your system gonna get 25, 30 percent more efficient for your users? It's difficult to it's so difficult to, to to justify the spend on IT against you know how, how much it will improve your system. So uh, we've gone really lean with the system. What, what we're doing now is we're not even changing the user interface. We're actually making our algorithm that does the matchmaking in the back much more efficient, so we can scale 
the actual matchmaking service without having really need to change the interface. And there'll come a point where, we've, so we've got say 400 technologies or something in the system and a really basic search navigation. So you can't, there's no drop down that you can add in keywords or anything like that. And it's starting to become not quite fit for purpose. Yeah. Um, but that's another big chunk of development to change the search, put re put like elastic search or something like that into the system. So that's the group we've done. So admin, not IT. I mean, that, we, we're, it's, it's fairly labour intensive to do the, to get technologies in, to upload them to the system, to be alerting, so we, we, we don't do um, automated alerts, so we have a matchmaking algorithm which will flag companies who have an interest in a particular technology, and then we'll personally alert each person. But it's, the, like, tech transfer is, is a, very much a people sort of business, so just blanket alerts, we felt, and a lot of people agree with us, that it, people wouldn't respond to. So we have a, we make it as efficient as possible. We still have. So for ages, me and Rob were doing that ourselves. So we're getting technologies in, and we're firing emails out to all, all the different companies. And hey, you've seen this technology? Think might be interest? Let me know. And then following up with them again to try and get them to respond. And it just it wasn't sustainable, you know. So I'm sure I'd like a, a business consultant would say, you know, don't spend any money on admin. But we we were getting communications graduates, so they were a little bit, you know, they were writing blogs for us, and you know, it was part of our marketing plan was to produce more rich content to feed out into, we use Twitter but it's a bit pass passive for our particular sector, most people are on LinkedIn so we, we find things through LinkedIn and that, so there was, it was more strategic than just admin but the, the admin helped as well, yeah. Phil, did you have a question? Uh, I did, yeah. So, when you were first starting out, um, you'd had the idea, you have seen what had been tried and failed before, how did you know your idea was okay? sufficiently good enough to actually get to work? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I guess we went and spoke to people. We went and spoke to people who knew more than us, I guess. So um, my colleague Rob was um, doing his postdoc at King's College, so he went and met with the head of commercialization there as a, as a King's sort of um, not employee at that, at that time. He managed to get the meeting quite easily, and that particular person was very open and, and still act as a kind of mentor for us no. now. So. We were there, like the first meeting I had was with some people at the University of Sheffield and I went with just a notepad, just with like, just I, you know, well, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you reckon, or what about that, and I was really, you know, they gave me an hour of their time and I chewed their ear off and I sort of, and they said, oh, this has been done, you know, and you go and look at what's been done, and it was just, I mean, it was just really obvious that it just, the websites were bad, you know, some of the links were broken and, you know, it just, it just, when, when someone said, oh, they've stood something like this before, but we said, have they done it this way? And so we, we yeah, we're a, an online matchmaking platform and we get lumped in with like other places where you can just post stuff online. Um, so there are databases you can post. You know, if you come up with the latest widget, you can go and post it online somewhere. But the chance of someone finding it is pretty remote. So we, we, were, we had to be very specific saying that's not what we do. We have a closed loop system, we have matchmaking algorithms, we capture interest areas when people sign up and that was quite difficult to get across. But it was mainly validating it by speaking to people. So we met, as, so I must have, the University of Sheffield we still network with, um, that's a long story I won't get into. Um, but we met a whole bunch of different people in the business team, all were willing to give their time and um, all had slightly different takes on it. Um, we went and met um, a bunch of people in company, so R&D, heads of R&D, uh, we bought a 200 quid ticket, which was part of the 1,000 quid we got from here. Um, and it's like a speed dating thing, so we go, pitch for five seconds, throw a business card down, what do you think? Get the feedback and had a bit, and a few of them agreed to have phone calls with us after, and we sort of, um, this was all before we'd even you know, really got a basic website together and just sort of sounding them out and seeing what they thought, asking them about what had happened previously and what they thought, why it hadn't worked and, and all that sort of stuff. And I found a, a few people said to me like, really careful who you speak to about your idea, you know, because you know, they're just going to run off and do it. And I'm, I'm more of the, I guess it was slightly reticent at certain times. I think you get a feel for if someone's just, you know, messing you around or something. But at the end of the day, you've got to go to people who know more than you. You know, if you just go blind and launch into something, you're going to, there's going to be a big caveat that you haven't predicted. Um, and that was my biggest fear that we'd sort of, I wanted to get to a point where I, I was sure, you know, well, and you're still never 100% sure. There's, that, there's a leap of faith moment where you still say, all right, here it is. And people, you know, criticism is the easiest thing for people to do, and people will criticise you. You know, I, I liken it to like music, you know, bands or whatever. You stand on stage and you play a song to someone, and you know, some people like, some people won't like it. So you open yourself up to all the criticism. But as long as 
you, I, I felt that as long as we felt we'd done enough research to validate it, then that's how we built our confidence, I guess, in the system. Peter? Can you just int introduce yourself? <coughs> Sorry, yes. You're right. uh, Peter Wallace, uh, he's Pro's Code, working at uh, trying to make um, computers that you talk to or chatbots make them more acceptable rather than annoying. Um, <laughs> annoying is the word. Uh, could you talk a bit more about how you're keeping, why somebody doesn't come along and copy what you've done? Mm. Uh, how are you preventing somebody doing that? Least yeah, no, it's critical mass. I mean, is, is the first right, answer. So, so I guess we had a bit of a um, a sprint, sort of, for the first year, eighteen months, to sort of try and get, you know, a, um, a client base which was kind of robust. Right. And we felt that if you keep your clients happy, then they'll stick with you. So, yeah, I mean, the short answer is they can. You know, someone else could come. You could come along tomorrow with, you know, a, lo a load of money and uh, look at our website. You know. I don't know, call up with a pseudonym and ask for some information and, you know, rip us off. But, um, you know, the, the the time it would take for someone to build a system the same as ours, that works as well, that has the amount of clients that we've got, have got all, already sort of good faith with our companies and universities. Um, you know, there's a, there's a leading time there that I think would hope that we'll be, unless we stagnated completely and just, you know, sat rested on our laurels and didn't do anything different, that we'd always be a reasonable number of steps ahead. So if someone came into the UK sector in particular, um, you know, and started speaking to our university about a very similar system, I'd hope they'd just say, well, we use this one and it works really well. Why would we use two? Um, so, yeah, but it's, there's no IP. We don't have any intellectual property in our system. We've, we're building in more sort of complex algorithms. We're looking at natural language processing to build out. So each company has a profile of keywords that we manually build for them at the moment. We're looking at sort of scraping the keywords in making the manual input much quicker and then using pluralizations and, and stuff like that to match keywords so we're building in more complexity into our system but at the start it was just a content management system yeah. you know you could have built it on wordpress really um so the, it, it's uh, loyalty from existing customers and then the notion of being ahead by continual development i'd say yeah well, i'd say yeah continually <laughs> improving your system speaking yeah. to your clients but also first mover advantage is what we had you know that's the buzzword that investments will investors will you know want to hear is that you know, who else is doing it you know if there's four companies doing it already and they're way ahead of you and got 100 employees yeah. you've got to have to have a, a very specific unique selling point i think to be able to enter into the into the market. You've got a ready-made exit strategy if there is already companies there that might buy you out I guess. Right. Um, but I think you have to, we refined our USPs, we're quite lucky that we don't have any direct competitors. Yeah. Um, some, quite a few indirect competitors um, but at the moment we get put through a single tender process at most universities where they can't really field similar tenders to what our system does. So we're quite lucky in that. So. Yeah, I don't know, it's just tough one. Something like you, you might probably be able to patent it. So you know, if you can get a patent, then that that's a, you know that's something investors will ask for. You know, have you patented it? Do you own exclusive rights to it? Yeah, yeah. exclusive license, that sort of stuff. Anybody else? Uh, in terms of partnering up with the universities, then um, how did you make that initial approach? Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Chris Mail. Uh, I run an organisation called Student Teaching. We essentially hire university music students to teach affordable lessons at local schools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so who did you kind of talk to within the university? You know, who's your initial point of contact? Because obviously they're massive organisations um, and, you know, one side of it doesn't necessarily know the ins and outs of what the other side is doing. So Yeah, so we, we're quite lucky in the fact that normally the knowledge transfer or the technology transfer office in the university has a sort of separate page on the website generally their contact details are on the website so we'd be able to look and see who's head of research and, and enterprise or you know who's head of commercialization who's head of ip um and sort of at the start we would you know get their details send them an email and just call them up you know pitch them over the phone can we come and meet you you know we've got this idea It'd be great and you know some said some said no some you know didn't care about what you knew. i got hung up on once um, but that was yeah, only, only one. In fact, that woman hung up with me. No, she hung up with me twice. I called her twice. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, luckily that didn't happen that often. People are generally happy to have a conversation. But we didn't because there's um, 
each university would only buy one subscription, so it's an institution-wide subscription. We were quite careful not to sort of, you know, cold call them all in the first six months and then burn through all the potential leads that we've had. So the first few months we had to do a bit of that to gain some initial traction. But after that we would sort of attend events that we knew that you know, a range of different universities were going to be at and actually try and meet people and get personal introductions. So now we, we partic well, particularly in the UK, you know, we won't just call them up and email them cold. We'll pretty much always wait till we've met someone at an event or get an introduction from someone else. So I don't know if, if there's find the key was kind of finding the job type and the person, you know, the job role that would be the people that would buy our subscription. Once we had that, it was, you know, much easier to find the right person to talk to. So, yeah, if you find that out, then you, the details are generally online at universities. is one of the benefits, I think. Uh, John Walker from Fellow 53. How much emphasis do you put on planning where you're going compared to sort of reacting to opportunities that come along? It sounds like what we've talked about, you, you sort of reacted to situations. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a really good really good question, and actually at our last board meeting, like our our um, investors has asked us to write a forecast for the next year and a budget for the next year, and it's such a pain, you know. <laughs> so if you if any of you are looking to do investment or whatever, you know, some investors they want a three year forecast of what you're going to do, and it's just utter bollocks, you know. But what it's a spreadsheet at the end of the day. So example of our, our current in investors that we had initially they said no. And they gave some really bad reasons for saying that. So we were like, you know, fine, say no, but don't say it for this reason. You know, so we went, and actually they re-engaged with us and went back. And then we get to meet the investment director and he's like, we show him our forecast and he's like, it's not ambitious enough. You know, you, know, you need to be you know, looking at additional products and you know, the graph needs to look more like this. So we're like, okay, no worries. We go back, <laughs> we've got three ideas for different products. We put a price on each one of them. We're gonna sell this many of them. We're gonna need this many people probably roughly to sell that many. Um, so the graph, come back and meet the chief investment officer, the graph looks like this. Um, you know, year three we've got, you know, I don't know, eight million quid cash in bank, or, you know, something ridiculous. <laughs> and the chief investment officer's like, these aren't realistic. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, and the, the director's in the room, and, and, our, and, and he was like, I, saw, I said, do you want to comment on this? You know, because you've told us, didn't you? You know, and I'm not going to let him get off the hook here. I was like, look, you told us, you know, to go away, and he's like, you're going to get different opinions. Yeah, you're going to get different opinions <laughs> and all this. So we ended up having to like rein it in a little bit and sort of go in the middle of it. So one of the things forecasting, and I've met some people that I was um, lucky enough to go to South by Southwest Interactive this year. I met some people who work in Silicon Valley and sort of chat to them about investment. And you know, so we we raised three hundred thousand quid and um, small in investment terms. Although for me, I think you know it's, it's a lot of money. And the guy, this guy from Silicon Valley, is like. I don't, they, you shouldn't even write your bother with a business plan for half a million. You know, it's just stupid. You know, I don't know why they do it in the UK. And I was like, yeah, but you know, I don't know. You've got to show you thought about it a little bit. You know, you're not just throwing money for nothing. So, and then most recently, we've, we've had to do this budget for the year. So looking at, so in the next two three months, you can sort of see quite clearly the meetings that we've had. You know, the decisions that we've got pending. You know, the revenue. So you, you can sort of it's be a bit movable, but you can sort of predict that. Thereafter is really just guessing game. So we're trying to sort of, I guess we have to think to a certain extent about longevity and you sort of you're planning your cash flow a little bit and trying to be careful about you know not going too quick without realising certain bits of revenue. So you're always going to be like up up and down to a certain extent. Um, so I say a year is probably the most that we've thought about so far. But again, we put the the plan to the board and they were like, no, it's not ambitious enough. So we've got to go and look at spreadsheet. It took hours, you know. It's, it's, I, I personally found it. Um, I think it's a useful process to go through to think about now that we've got our investment and you know we're employing more people. It's a useful process to go to to think about the next year. It won't go to that plan, you know. It will definitely change. But to think about it in that sort of way, and if we happen to, you know, accelerate quicker and we can bring in another person, you know, ahead of when we thought we could, that's great. If we have to sort of wait to make an additional additional hire or something like that then you know, a little bit and in the first year it was definitely so our first in investment was um we got a fifty thousand pound business angel investment um and that had to pay you know myself and my co-founder build a whole website and the lag time between doing that train fares and, and all that sort of stuff so once we built the website which is the main 
think um, after that we were just sort of you know you're trying to keep going basically you know you're trying to get money to keep paying yourself and keep the business going so that was the first year was was kind of you react and however we wanted to plan you know we've only got enough money to pay ourselves a couple of months. what can you do you, know, you can do all the planning you want but if you've not got the, the money in your bank you can't fly off to we couldn't have gone to America at that point to do a conference or do you know what I mean it was no matter how much we plan we'd still have to be reactive as to each month what's coming up what can we afford to do this month is it worth taking the risk on that this month because yeah. it might help us out in the next couple of months and we said you know we, we drew the line on quite a few conferences that we could have gone to that we almost would definitely have met people at that might have bought our subscription but so it's kind of sort of relatively short term risk management because you know what, what's going on what's the biggest risk opportunity and plotting a path which sort of falls in line with that pretty much yeah i'd say i'd say that yeah i'm not well this is just what what we did you know it wasn't it wasn't rockets we did write a business plan at the start um a couple of things we said we were going to roll out as products we haven't done turned out you know it didn't make sense to do them and we weren't sure they were going to work so we've we've kept very sort of We've gone with a sort of Twitter mentality where we've got this, you know, product, this system. It works well. People are buying it. People are renewing with us. Let's focus on this for now. And then once we've that builds up our competitive advantage with more, you know, clients and users and and the rest of it. And then once we've got a where that point will be, we've we've just employed someone who's our head of growth, um, and his job is to look at monetizing our companies. Um, you know, pro we've got some ideas and products, but actually finding the time to roll them out into actual products is difficult so and that's more of a sort of planning aspect so he's now planning out he's going to do um, get people in a room you know beta testers so to speak you know pitch them a few ideas we're thinking about they'll be kind of hopefully early adopters and stuff so that we're starting to plan a little bit more from that aspect but yeah I think now we, ha we do have more employees and therefore you're spending more money every month in wages and office space and all the rest of it you have to sort of I'd say you probably have to plan a little bit more at the start. It's sort of, yeah, risk reward assessment, I guess. So you've got the possibility now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, once once we, I think at the end of first year, coming into coming into second year, we, we got to a point where we were consistently getting more money in the bank each month than was going out. And at that point, you can then have some additional flexibility because, you know, it's not like we're trying to cream off dividends at this point or anything like that. We're really just putting it all back into to scale in the business. So at that point, we were sort of thinking, okay, well, let's go to the one we didn't go to last year and let's try this one out. And we weren't, we wouldn't buy conference stands at each one, for example. One of us would attend because it's cheaper, find out if the event was going to be worthwhile, and then this next year we'll you know, strategically think about the ones we'll shout about a little bit, a little bit more. Got time for one more, um, and then we're going to have time to, you know, network a little bit and approach Patrick after one to one. So, Natalia, last one. Okay, I'm Natalia from Pira Panela, and I just want to ask, uh, how much equity have you given away, and why? Um, I mean. The, equ the equity's changed from start, to start from both inv both investments, so you know there's a negotiation process that goes through. So uh, yeah, the first investment we we got our first investment when we were minus 400 quid in the bank. We had a PowerPoint presentation and some business cards. So you know, it, I think we we had a business value. Yeah, we gave away I don't know, I think 50, I think it's 20 percent. I think we gave away at the start, um, which is a big chunk. You know that that was it. But we were in the position where I wasn't prepared to. Um, loan the money. You know, I didn't want to borrow the money off anyone. I didn't want a loan hanging over my head. It was a high risk. I felt it was still high risk business that people hadn't really done before. Um, so I was much more comfortable giving away the equity at that point. Um, now, in hindsight, maybe we gave away a little bit too much, but we'd never done a business before. You know, so, you know, we needed. We we're at the point where we probably could have waited. You know, a few more months, and negotiated with some more business angel. You know, probably I say a few more months, probably six months or so. Negotiate with some more business angels and maybe got a slightly better deal. But we were at the, we were ready. At the, we're at the time in our lives we were ready to do it to a certain extent. And the second valuation we had, I think, was we valued, we valued it at like 2.5 million or something. Just fairy tale numbers, really. But and I think with the, we negotiated down to about 1.8. Um, so that was that was that was much less. And the rest of the equity is still you know, myself and my co-founder. Uh, we you know 60% of the business we we own between us. Uh, no more than that, 60. 
68, I, I can't remember, but we still, you know, we feel that, yeah, exactly. So at, at the board, we things that you'll get with your institutional investors is, you know, there'll be voting rights and, and all this different sort of stuff. So we have very much control of our, our board. You know, if they can't force us to do anything, there are certain things that if we, if it all goes tits up, they, you know, they get their money back first and, and that sort of stuff, which is usual. That's, again, that's what I'd want if I'd have put the money in. So, but we've, we've m maintained control. So it's a difficult decision that founders have to wrestle with. You know, are you happy, you know, you're coming up with an idea, it's, it's yours, you're very precious about it. Um, me and Rob took the decision that, you know, it was like, it was kind of now, you know, we've got this opportunity, someone's gonna give us some, we can quit our jobs, we can pay ourselves. If it goes belly up in, you know, six months, a year, all right, we've had blood, sweat and tears and a lot of stress along the way, but we'd have learned a lot, you know, so um, valuations, are, it's a difficult, difficult point, you know, you'll negotiate and they'll tell you less and you'll say you think it's worth more, so being able to argue your sort of corner and I've met people who have done businesses before, um, you know, even ones that have you know, failed or whatever, and I think having the background, if you have done that, to negotiate harder is probably better. I think we were in a good position for our venture capital investment in that we didn't need their money. You know, we weren't, we didn't have a high burn rate, we turned a small profit, we had cash in the bank to pay everyone, we, you know, we were okay at that point. It was an acceleration investment, so we weren't just going to take any deal at that point. Um, so the why is, it's really, it's, it's, it's not a, it's such a difficult, you know, you wrestle with it yourself and what you're happy to give away and, um, you know, if you can, if you can afford to do your business with your own money for a length of time that gets you to the point where you're getting revenue, by all means do it. You know, we didn't have money, you know, we didn't have any, any money and we didn't really want to, no, our parents aren't wealthy or, or anything like that, we didn't really want to go to them and canvas our family for money for something that, you know, then if you, if you lose it all, it's like, they're doing it because, not because they've really assessed the, the value proposition in your business and the investment opportunity. They're doing it because like, they know me, you know, or as a family. So we didn't really want to want to do that. We felt that if we had a good enough idea, someone should invest in it. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying, yeah, we, we, we gave away a, a chunk at the start. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly don't sit here now and regret that. The guy's added a lot of value to us. He risked his own money at the start at a very high risk business. And he's our chairman still now. Um, you know, we work with him pretty closely. And um, yeah, and luckily we've managed to yeah, maintain you know, sort of majority majority share in the company. Okay, I just have one last question just to hopefully wrap up a little bit and then we'll go get more coffee and I'm sure some of you will have some more questions for Patrick. Um, but you have a lot going on right now yeah. and there's been a lot going on in general for the last two or three years. <laughs> Story of your life, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so now you're moving into a new office today, um, scaling up. You, you're breaking into the US, you've got all kinds of things going on. What is the biggest challenge for you that you see right now and within the next couple of months? Um, I think that, yeah, it's a good question. We're in a hiring phase, we need to hire another developer. That's going to be difficult. Um, we've not had great applications so far. If anyone knows any developers, might be interested in the job. What kind of developers? Front end. Okay. Yeah, full stack front end. Sort of. Developer. We're also looking. So. You're <laughs> 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 Is anyone else looking for a developer? Um, so that's 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 a, that's a difficult one. But um, yeah, the the US stuff is yeah. So trying to keep on top of uh, you know a, a full sort of US push, whilst also trying to expand our UK university. So we have forty four universities, that probably re represents about 80% of the research intensive ones, but we want to get sort of 80 in the next year. So employing people and then we will need to get some sales people employed, which are notoriously very difficult to, to get up and up to speed and you know, you cost you money before you, you make any money from them and, and that sort of stuff. So yeah, there's, there's, there's th those two things. And then our head of growth we started last week, um, he's got the job in his hands to monetize the, you know, the companies using our system. So I'm hoping that we'll have something we can actually pitch as a sellable product in the next month. Um, so that's another, another challenge as well. 
<laughs> no, it's not 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 one there. No. As always. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, and no thanks everyone for your uh, questions as well. Can we have a massive round? Of Excellent uh, presentation. <laughs> Cheers, thanks. And we're going to.